up until this operation, that is, uh, from about 1945 through 1951, the chance of failure has never been more than about 10%. In uh, Crossroads, uh, Sandstone, and Greenhouse, uh, we had great confidence in the operation succeeding. We recognized the change in velocity, however, when Dr. Bradbury spoke to a group of us in the Solomos. Gentlemen, up to now, the laboratory has had sufficient time to compile information and revise weapon design before a field test of a weapon. As of now, the situation has changed. We must take risks, calculated risks, it is true, but risks nevertheless. According to the presidential directive, we must ascertain if a hydrogen bomb is feasible and do this in the highest possible speed. Here is what I think we must do. We must set up a special staff under Dr. Marshall Holloway reporting directly to my office. He will receive from the theoretical division the theoretical designs of such a system. Have it fabricated. Okay, I'll set the staff. Why, sir? You have a grandstand seat here to one of the most momentous events in the history of science. In less than a minute, you will see the most powerful explosion ever witnessed by human eyes. The blast will come out of the horizon just about there. And this is the significance of the moment. This is the first full-scale test of a hydrogen device. If the reaction goes, we're in the thermonuclear era. For the sake of all of us, and for the sake of our country, I know that you join me in wishing this expedition well. It is now 30 seconds to zero time. Put on goggles or turn away. Do not remove goggles or face burst until 10 seconds after the first light. this blast did to the atoll, nobody knows. Re-entry parties are leaving the Rendova now by helicopter. The Navy Task Group, commanded by Rear Admiral Wilkins, has the problem of providing the means to re-enter shortly after the blast, to get exposed film, samples, and other scientific data. Since no land mass is available, the problem is complicated. Re-entry must be from a ship. Further, fallout will be very high starting at about M plus one hour. Helicopters must get in quickly and get out again before that hour is up. One survey group is leaving here from the Estes. 
I can't go along, but you can, and see for yourselves, through the eyes of the camera, what has happened back on the Azor. of titanic energy released by stars. But even the largest man-made explosion in the history of the world has little meaning unless we compare it to everyday items we understand. So at this point, let's replay the detonation. Go back and watch Mike in action once again. Remember those final last seconds? Five, four, three. This is the largest fireball ever produced. At its maximum, it measures about three and one quarter miles in diameter. Compared to the skyline of New York, this means that with the Empire State Building as zero point, the Mike Fireball would extend downtown to Washington Square and uptown to Central Park. In other words, the fireball alone would engulf about one quarter of the island of Manhattan. A tremendous upsurge of air from the detonation rapidly pushes up the mic cloud. Again, nothing of this height and width has ever before been witnessed. If the picture is stopped at this point in the cloud's growth, the height of the cloud is approximately 40,000 feet. This means that 32 Empire State buildings at 1,250 feet per building could be piled one on top the other before they would attain the cloud's height at this time, roughly two minutes after zero. Some 10 minutes later, the cloud approaches its maximum. At this time, the mushroom portion of the cloud has pushed up to around 10 miles and spreads out along the base of the stratosphere to a width of about 100 miles, while the stem itself is pushed upward deep into the stratosphere to a height of about 25 miles. The results of this tremendous power can be shown at the atoll. Here is an aerial photo of the test area of the atoll before the blast. And here is the same area after the blast, showing the crater caused by Mike. The outlined island in the center is former Ilugilab, the Zero Island. Sections of the islands on either side have been chopped off. The crater is roughly a mile in diameter, when it is illustrated that some 14 Pentagon buildings could be comfortably accommodated in this hole, the size of the Mike crater becomes more real. In profile, the crater gradually slopes down to a maximum depth of some 175 feet, or equivalent to the height of a 17-story building. The lateral destructive effects are the greatest yet observed from a single explosive device. Without getting into the areas of target evaluation or secondary effects, it can be safely assumed that there was complete annihilation within a radius of three miles, or out to and including all of Enjabi that there was severe to moderate damage out to seven miles or down to Rujoro, and that light damage extended as far as 10 miles or down to Runnet. Relating this area of damage to a city like Washington, D.C., would present a picture something like this. With the capital as zero point, there would be complete annihilation west to Arlington Cemetery, east to the Anacostia River, north to the soldiers' home, and south to Bowling Field. Complete annihilation and that is mentioning merely the primary damage. What you have just seen was an awesome turning point in history, a development affecting not only the future of humanity, but the security of our nation, the safety of our communities, and the well-being of our homes and our families. 